Good afternoon and welcome to a signal event in the McCloskey Speaker Series. <laughs> I'm thrilled that we have for a return engagement, not her first time, if you recall. I have lured you here before. Um, we have the great Alice Water. So let's all <laughs> applaud her for coming. <laughs> So we're thrilled to have Alice because she reminds us of our ideals. She lives them every day and she's completely tireless and unstoppable. Ask anyone who has worked for her. Ask anyone who has received the texts at two in the morning and then they resume at five in the morning. And they're inspirations, they're new ideas. She never stops coming up with new ideas. And at first, uh, she'll tell a group, usually of young people, think big. How big can we think? And then she'll say, no, bigger. And she won't stop until she gets so much farther than any sane, rational, lucid person <laughs> would ever think that she would. Um, I first encountered her when I was given a national restaurant critic job. I was. I was barely out of college and I was incredibly excited and I thought, well, every place I go has to be the Chez Panisse of that city. But I have to go out and see what Chez Panisse is because I've read so much about it and it seems so intolerably precious. And then I went and Alice led me to Bob Kennard's farm. That is her longtime farmer who still farms, who still produces Every single thing that he grows goes to Chez Panisse. And as soon as we got there, she dropped to her feet, grasped outside so, something like Christina's world by Wyeth. And Chris, <laughs> Christina is, you know, picking wild blueberries. That's what she's doing on that hill in, in Cushing, Maine. She's picking wild blueberries, and that's how Wyeth painted her. She was picking wild strawberries. And she said, oh, Bob, you have fraise de bois. And, and um, she put three in my hand because that's what Alice does. She gets you. She gets you with food. She has said that if she could get a student with one ripe peach and the juice drizzling down her arm, she has them for life. So we are going to be talking today about her incredible um, recent achievements in edible education, which you see right there. We'll be taking a closer look at these slides later in the talk. Um, but I wanted to begin by saying, first of all, we're thrilled to have you. And second, you recently wrote a memoir, Becoming. It is um, about becoming an activist. It's about being schooled in ideals, and it was the free speech movement, was it not, at UC Berkeley? Well, I called the book Coming to My Senses. Maybe many of you have read it. I, I, the subtitle was... All of you, pretend you have if you <laughs> have. <laughs> the subtitle was The Making of a Counterculture Cook. And I wanted to do the book. I, at, at first, I told my editor I was not doing this book about Chez Panisse because I had written a book for the 40th birthday talking about the making of Chez Panisse. This was going to be about something else, about my roots and, and how I came to open the doors of the restaurant. And yes, I uh, did grow up actually in New Jersey, but my family moved to California and I ended up going to Berkeley in 1964, just at the beginning of the free speech movement. Yes, none of us believes it, but it is true. Um, she was still in grammar school, uh, <laughs> but very precocious. Um, but it was some of those ideals, and for example, Cesar Chavez's um, farm worker strikes that were terribly influential in, in your student time, were they not? Well, they were. I, I didn't know, actually, until I read the book and looked back on my childhood. Uh, by the way, I wrote this book in a very unusual way. Uh, because I had a good friend who took dictation 
and she had worked for me as my assistant, and she was 35 years old. And then I had an old friend who I'd known since my daughter was born. He was 60 years old, and he was always a provocateur, a writer himself. And so the two of them just interrogated me. And so we just went from subject to subject, and, and I didn't think I could remember anything from when I was really little. And they said, well, you know, you must remember. What kind of, what kind of yard did you have? What were the trees in the yard? And all of a sudden, I remembered the willow trees and climbing on the willow trees and playing outside for my whole childhood. I mean, really, we, we didn't have a television, if you can imagine, <laughs> um, until way into the 50s. And uh, so I played with my friends, and I learned the names of all the flowers which I can remember, and the birds, and I had a rock collection. <laughs> and so I, I don't think my, my really love of nature and farmers is really something that, that happened out of a political decision. It really was um, really that childhood in nature and then going to France when I was 19. But also, can you guide us through, because you really created edible education as a, as a whole ethos, as an idea, incorporating food, how it grows, what you eat, how you eat it, into the whole elementary school curriculum. But how do you get from Montessori experiential education to edible education? And I'm not sure how you even got to Montessori? Well, I went, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, after I graduated from college, and I had a friend who was teaching Montessori right up the street from where I lived. And she said, would you like to come and be an assistant at the school? So I went, and um, it was learning by doing. It was the education of the senses. So we were with little tiny children, three to six years old, and I was not prepared to be with those little young children. And I thought, well, if I really love this pedagogy, I need to go and learn. And so I went to England in 1968, a beautiful time to to be in England and in France for that matter. Same kind of uh, really sort of cultural revolution. But did you go on. to train in Maria Montessori's precepts or, or how did you continue any of this? I did. And I had to learn by doing. And so they would send us out in Hampstead, right out to the Heath, and we were to collect uh, leaves and, uh, um, you know, trace the shapes of the leaves into uh, a book. And we were to learn how to write neatly and to do calligraphy. And it was very, very important, these, the ways in which I learned how to teach this subject in this way. Al Alice has yeah. the most beautiful manuscript, and she always uh, writes in a calligraphic pen. But even the restaurant check I succeeded in reversing today because she <laughs> naughtily tried to pay the restaurant check um, is a work of art, and they're going to bring they're going to be able to save that now uh, as an authentic relic. Please. Buy her books and ask her to sign them, and you'll see. But you come back from England and you decide. It's not that I've had enough of this, I like this. Um, it's true. I started teaching, though, in the Montessori school, and I wasn't, I realized, patient enough. And if you've read the memoir, um, I wasn't fired for um, biting a little kid. 
<laughs> who was biting other little children. And I thought, I'm just going to bite him, we won't stop. <laughs> but <laughs> you'll see how that feels. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't fired for that reason. Um, but I was fired because I was wearing see-through glasses. <laughs> they had lots of flowers embroidered on the front, <laughs> but, but somebody had complained. And I learned something extremely valuable, that I don't want to be in a place where I'm not appreciated. And I really felt that way. I felt like I, I can't be here. And I, uh, I was cooking at home at that time. And I just said, hey, I want to eat like the French and live like the French. Maybe I need to open a restaurant. And it was just like that. So when I first met you in a, you know, a very long time ago and the restaurant was fairly young, certainly you were introducing the idea of farmers as an integral part of any restaurant, any menu, any food we made at home. We should know where that food was grown. We should honor it. We should pay a higher price. These are uh, precepts that have never left you. It's still an integral part of what you, you advocate today. But I don't remember when the idea of edible education in Berkeley, which of course you made me take another plane trip out to mm -hmm. see in practice at the King's School because right. Alice crooks her finger and, and you just wind up coming. No, but I, it's very important to know that I was looking for taste. I wasn't looking for sustainability, or maybe I was a little bit because I red diet for a small planet, <laughs> and I lived in Berkeley. But I was really looking for the taste of food like I had tasted in France. And I bought that food in the farmer's markets, and I ate it in little restaurants. And they had single menus, not choice. They would have a fixed price menu. But we're talking France, we're not talking I'm, we're Berkeley. Talking <laughs> No, but when I came back, that's what I wanted for Chez Panisse, a fixed price menu. Now, when you have that, when there's no choice, it has to be really good. And I mean really good. So we were scouting. We had a forager who was on our staff, and her job was to go out all around and find people that were growing uh, you know, fresh de bois or, or peaches or, or had, uh, um, you know, lamb. And, and, and that's how we became connected. And once we, we had that, that flavor there, we had the customer because they loved this. And then we ended up uh, putting their names on the menu because, as Carla Petrini of Slow Food would say, we became co-producers. I valued them as much as the cooks in the restaurant. And we were always working in that collaborative way. But I, I didn't really think that I was using all of those Montessori ideas, but I was, in the way that I ran the restaurant. I wanted everybody to taste everything. I wanted to compare it, this grape with that grape. And, and, and we were constantly in the place. Can we do it better than we have to? And every year we say, do we want to continue the restaurant or not? Is it a challenge? And every year for 48 years, we have said yes. Because Alice is discontent without drama. <laughs> and so every year there's a crisis. Should we close the restaurant <laughs> now, this year? <clears throat> oh, you. No, but I, I realized when I had a child that she was going to be going 
to, to a school. And I would not be able to, to have an influence around her life at that time. And I worried about what was going in the on in the public school systems in Berkeley. And I was shocked to discover how, how much they had fallen apart. I don't know whether you know that the public schools in California are number 40, 46, I think, in terms of academic achievement. 46 in the nation. So you can imagine that there was no money to, to keep up the school. It's to, Prop 2 and a half, right, Californians? It was Prop uh, 30, uh, oh God, Prop 36? 13. 13. 13. Was it Prop 13? 39. Well, it was the one that really um, had uh, uh, taken away the tax on people who had a second home. And when that happened, it just took so much money away from, from all the infrastructure of cities, including the public schools. And it was a really, I mean, it's just been going downhill for a very long time. I should know how many years, but it's a very long time at least 35 years or more. I think it froze a lot of property tax. So just <laughs> it was it, huge. It, 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 it was set huge. the schools in place. So you find this out that Fanny is not getting good food. You are shocked, shocked, and you decide <laughs> you are not only going to complain about it, you are going to do something about it. <laughs> well, I was interviewed in um, about, I'm sure, gardens or farmers, and I just said, in the middle of it all, how could the public school system fa fall apart the way that it has in the enlightened city of Berkeley with one of the greatest universities in the nation? And so the principal of one of those schools in Berkeley called me up and he said, come on over. I want your help to beautify the school. And that was 25 years ago. And I went over to his school. And it was built on 17 acres back in 1921. And it was for 500 students. Today they have 1,000 students that speak 22 different languages at home. And they are middle school students. So they're 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, a very difficult group. And, uh, but there was a lot of land. Some of it had, had you know, trailers for classrooms on it at one point, and it was broken up asphalt and weeds, and, but there was still a lot of land. And immediately I said, we want that for a garden. A garden not to teach gardening per se, but to teach the academic subjects. Maybe it's a math class, maybe it's a biology class, maybe it's an art class. Geography. Geography class. But we, so we wanted that. And then there was an old bungalow right at the end of the, the space. And I said, we could have a kitchen classroom where we could really cook the food from the place that, that we're learning about, the history of China. Or it could, we could cook Chinese food. Show a placemat. Okay. Well, this has developed into a much bigger idea. This is just an idea of one of the placemats that we have about, uh, from a geography class. And we're learning about what grows in the Arabian Peninsula, at what altitude, sea level, um, and what it is. It, where it's in relationship to, to Asia and Africa. And so this might be uh, something you would serve for lunch, some, some uh, uh, what are those? <laughs> yes, yes, pita? falafel. Falafel? And, and pita bread. And you might be having, um, you know, a carrot salad. Uh, you might be in 
studying the Silk Road in India and seeing what foods were taken along the Silk Road. You might be having a curried, uh, uh, a little curry in a chapati with some raita on the side. Goat, some of okra. course, it being an elementary school. No, but I'm, I'm thinking of foods that the kids in the school really like. They like to dip things. They like to, and when they know about the culture a little bit, they're very curious. They're also empowered to do the cooking themselves. Um, this is a, a fried rice dish. And here we are in the civilizations of the Americas. Maybe it's a language class that you're having. And you're going into the cafeteria, and you're all sitting at tables together. And this is something very important and an idea that I had from day one. When I talked to Neil Smith, the principal, I said, we can't eat standing up. We can't go through a cafeteria line. We need to sit down and have a tortilla soup, maybe a little jicama or radishes, some little pieces of tortilla. And so I have been dreaming about this idea for a very long time and practicing the way that school lunches could be served. And about a year ago, we decided, and Barbara Boxer, who's one of our wonderful senators was, um, came over to the restaurant to have dinner with me. And I said, how can we put this out into the state of California to change school lunch and to address climate change and to support the farmers who are taking care of the land. So there we are. Um, provide a sustainable school lunch for all students K through 12 to buy that food directly the way that Chez Penny's has always done. We have a network of probably 85 people we buy from. Some only have one tree for two weeks. And we get all of their mulberries. And it's the most delicious fruit. And we make it into mulberry ice cream. And people look forward to that moment at the restaurant. And then, we want to support the farms that are taking care of the farm workers. And that's a very important piece of this. And then the last part is to teach all of the students about the values of nourishment, community, and, and stewardship of the land. And that is what these kids have absorbed in the three years that they go to the Edible Schoolyard. And now I'm very happy to say that we have a network around the world and that we have, I Alice hate, believes in the printed page. And as the editor of Ideas, the magazine, the Aspen <laughs> Institute, I strongly advocate the printed page. We have almost 7,000 schools. We have them. <laughs> and, and these aren't schools that we have any kind of control over. These are just schools that believe in stewardship of the land, in community and nourishment. And that they are either using a kitchen or a garden for teaching. And they may or may not have school lunch, but they're all around the world. They're in all the slope food schools all throughout Italy. But Africa. And Africa, there are, it's, it's an amazing network so that people can connect with each other, find out what in that climate, what they're doing in Maine in the middle of winter. We have an edible schoolyard in New York City. You might have heard about it out in, um, um, in Brooklyn. Where else? Where else? Where else but in Brooklyn? You may have heard that in the city of New York, they've decided to give every student a free school lunch. 
from K through 12. This happened last year. And they want it to be, it is, it's amazing. That's good. So if we can help them to connect with the farm network in and around New York, they will have done a lot of the research that we need for doing it in California. But, uh, yes. Well, there's more. There's um, more. <laughs> first of all, that you showed that map, I was about to say, this is beautiful and it seems almost utterly divorced from reality. The realities of procurement, of getting, uh, I, I went recently to a very inspirational conference called The Power of Procurement, and when I told this name to a number of my relatives, they raised their eyebrows. But it was in fact about the people you buy food from for school systems. You have enormous power in where you buy your food uh, and how that happens. And you not only dream of enacting this on a statewide level in California, you have made inroads, have you not, Alice? Well, we believe that the governor of the state of California is going to help make this happen. And we have the, uh, his wife, Jennifer Sabo, helping us build a task, task force. We have uh, had the most amazing good luck because I was given an award at the Forbes 400. And I asked if I could feed them all a school lunch as, as the food for the event. And they agreed that I could. And I said, well, I'm going to do something from the Middle East because it's in the Jewish Museum in San Francisco. And it seemed really appropriate. So I made them a tubuli salad and I made them a spicy carrot soup, and we had pita bread, and we had hummus. And in the front row was the mayor of Stockton, and he was sitting next to a wonderful philanthropist. And he came over to me. This is Alice's dream pairing. Yeah. <laughs> and I talked for a little while um, about what school lunch as an academic subject meant. And he said, I want to do it in all 53 schools in the city of Stockton. So we have a model that we have started. And we're going to need everybody to help to find the farms, to find the, the ways that we can edibly educate from kindergarten all the way through high now, school. Now, some of your seemingly completely unrealistic rules and precepts include um, you want the food to be cooked on site. And as anyone who's tried to make inroads into improving school lunch knows, uh, school kitchens are not really kitchens. They're reheating stations at best. Uh, they have microwaves. They occasionally have a steam oven. But they don't actually prep food or make food. Even um, the beloved to many here, Yale University, wasn't making its food uh, from scratch or having any idea how to prep vegetables. And when Fanny's daughter went to Yale, she not only took Alice's the Alice's daughter, Alice, Fanny. Alice. Well, we, we <laughs> hope someday Fanny will have a daughter who goes to Yale. Yes. <laughs> um, so when Fanny went to Yale, Alice being Alice, buttonholed Rick Levin, the then president, and said, <laughs> you know, you have to do something. You're not preparing your food from scratch. You're not buying it from organic farmers. What are you doing to these poor students? How are you ruining a generation of leaders by not filling them with, with better food? And she changed the kitchens at Yale with the Yale Sustainable Food Project, uh, which was, you know, something great and had a huge influence on colleges around the, around the country. But you think food should be prepared on site, which is an enormous obstacle, an enormous challenge. You think that there should be a chef making it and you think that it should be organic. How is this going to be realistic in Stockton, do you suppose? Well, we have been working with a group in Richmond, right next to Berkeley, a very poor school system, and in West Marin. And um, they call themselves the Conscious Kitchen. 
And what they decided to do, because they had the approval of the superintendent of schools and the head of the, the um, cafeteria, the food service, and they had a nutritional person at the school that all wanted change. And so they began by beautifying the gymnasium of the school and making it into a place for all of the children to sit together, to sit down and eat. And then they invited chefs um, th from various restaurants, um, wonderful Mex Mexican restaurant nearby, to come and help in their very small kitchen to think about what they could serve. Um, and they knew many of the suppliers in Marin. So they started buying a whole, uh, as uh, the chicken guy, the organic chicken guy, that sells $30, you know, organic chickens, whether they could have the legs and the bones so that he could take the breast and the thighs to the farmer's market. So they got, uh, they gave, the farmer more money and he was so happy to bring the bones and the legs to the school so they could make a chicken stock or they could barbecue the chicken leg and then they asked Strauss Dairy which is one of our great a cult <laughs> object for those of us yeah. who visit San Francisco and, and they said well uh, we'd like to bring it in big containers we'll bring it to the school instead of selling it in this little small, we can sell it to you at that same price. And, and so they just gathered the farmers around them and they worked with the kitchen and uh, to, to cook the food, very simply. And I have to say, they fit into the USDA reimbursement. So they were doing them at a dollar fifty to a dollar eighty a plate, and all of those dishes that I showed you are within that range of the reimbursement from the USDA. Okay, so that's an amazing fact. And I didn't ask you this at lunch, so you're unprepared for this question. <laughs> but um, there's a famous example of a of a guy named Dan Juicy, a wonderful, idealistic, practical chef who. Uh, was the executive chef of Noma mm -hmm. and in Copenhagen and came and said, I'm going to devote my life to bettering school food. And he found New London, Connecticut, which although it's in Connecticut on the coast, is poor, and got them to let him take over the school system, insisting on chefs' uh, food from scratch. But his model requires philanthropists to donate and subsidize this system even if it does come in at USDA, is that part of what will happen in Stockton, that you'll be separately raising money to supply them? I hope not. But when you're making a model, you have to understand that it costs more. And you are hiring foragers. You are hiring really incredible teachers and amazing cooks to teach the cooks how to do this. And it always costs more to make the model. But I know now from writing this book, uh, which I'm, I'm doing it seasonally, summer, fall, winter, spring. But this book is about school food. You haven't yes, it is. mentioned that you are writing a new yes. book and it is about school food. I'm writing two food. books. One of them is a manifesto. And it's about... Wait, that's slow food territory. You're taking <laughs> over. <laughs> well, it really is because it's how do we teach uh, slow food values in a fast food culture. And I decided that the best way to do this is through our last really truly democratic institution, the public school system. That is where we can reach every child while they're young and open and learning. And we can feed them these values. So that's where I wanted to begin. But I wanted to really write about what fast food culture is doing and has done to us. 
And it's a very hard book to write, Corby. It's a really, it's very intense, and I'm writing it with my two friends again. And we talk about what it means, uniformity. When you eat fast food, you digest the values that come with it. It's okay to eat in your car. Time is money. More is better. Everything should be available 24-7, no matter where you are. You know, we're, cooking is drudgery. Farming is drudgery. And we're, we've accepted this, we've digested this. And that's what's happened to this country, that we think it's okay to be a little dishonest. We think it's okay to be greedy. It's all, you know, it's all for ourselves. And I think it's very hard to reach people once they are addicted, once you're in these habits, once you're eating your food and talking on your cell phone, maybe just having it under the table with a couple conversations. And 85% of the kids in this country don't eat one meal with their family. Well, you've so nicely set me up for my food and society at the Aspen Institute program, as I had asked you to do, Alice. <laughs> um, we did discuss briefly. I run a policy program here uh, called Food and, and Society at the Aspen Institute, and I'm doing food as medicine and how to help heal a lot of the damage that fast food has created by introducing more healthful food to places that don't have it and meal providers that don't think they're equipped to make more healthful meals, but in fact are food banks, churches, uh, all kinds of Meals on Wheels programs. And you were saying something that's been always so central to your idea, coming back to flavor, which is that health begins in the soil. It won't be part of my program except teaching everybody, um, but it is part of your ideals. It is deeply part of my it's, it's It's very hard to grow food <laughs> with the GMO and the pesticides and the herbicides and think that you can have something that's nourishing. And we have never talked about this in schools of health. Um, and it's shocking to me that we are not addressing. I mean, many, many people are looking into the soil because when it is regeneratively um, um, nourished, we can address climate. So now it's really coming into view what has been in our soil. But I've always known that Vegetables and fruits are, can be, because of Bob Kennard and his care of his soil, he, he said 10 times more nutritious for us. I never believed him. Now he's had it tested, and it is. His carrots really are. And so I want to have that understanding um, around this country, and it's why no matter what kind of feeding program is going on, I believe that we can pay the farmer the money, the real money that person needs to have to grow the food, and that we can cook, if we cook in a way that is using all the stems, is using, not wasting one bit of the food, we can make nutritious, affordable food well, for our basic diet. Agreed. Two things. Uh, first of all, the terrible lack of nutrition education is starting. There's progress being made on it. Universities across the country, like Oklahoma and Tulsa, are Oklahoma. doing culinary, <laughs> culinary medicine. Um, I teach at the uh, Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition and Science Policy. and. The fastest growing program is about the environment. And okay. so I've, I'm just starting a course, uh, changing, uh, combining nutrition and the environment. Um, and you um, 
are thinking seriously about sustainability and institutionalizing that with your name on it, are you not? Well, I'm very, very pleased. And I think this is general knowledge. <laughs> Um, Not in this room, or, perhaps. I mean, in, in the University of California at Davis, because they're building uh, a new sustainable center uh, on the Aggie campus in the middle of Sacramento. And they've asked me to design a food, um, an edible education center. And I'm thinking to do this to train everyone in the state of California and maybe beyond about cooking affordable, delicious, nutritious food for themselves and for the schools. And what's the working name of this? The working name? Yes. Did I tell you something at lunch that I don't know? I think you said it was going to be called the Alice Waters okay. Sustainable <laughs> Food Institute. Yes. <laughs> so we're about to embark on questions. And I hope we have questions from the audience. I hope we have mic runners. Um, and I hope you're thinking about how to incorporate sustainability in your own lives. Do we have any questions? We have some in the front. It's always nice to have a straw hat and a woman in the third row right here. We'll start with the lady on that side. Yes, a wonderful presentation, Alice Waters. I worked in a very large school system for many years and I was horrified at the amount of food waste of the food that was actually nutritious, like a fresh fruit and so forth, that the children threw away. So my question has to do with, have you noticed in these meals that you've had them prepared, what the waste is? Is, is it reduced? I'm hoping it is. Well, we've been practicing this um, really at Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School in Berkeley uh, for all these years, and I know that when the kids are growing it and cooking it, they eat it all. And I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. It's the empowerment, the pride in, in having grown it and cooked it that is part of their desire to finish it and encourage their friends. And it changes their family cooking, you uh, said. Uh, yes, well, I... Uh, I mean, it's, I say it's six weeks to kale. And, <laughs> and that, that every kid who graduates from that school in Berkeley could probably give a TED talk because they have learned osmosis, a lot of it osmosis. When you're going out for a math class in the garden, you're picking, you may be planting seeds, but you're picking some of the raspberries while you're out there and you're, you're in nature and there isn't a kid who wants to miss a class that's in the garden or the kitchen because it's another kind of pedagogy that's happening. And they, I mean, and it's something really tried and true. Montessori worked 100 years ago in the slums of Naples and in India with children that were hungry and uh, in neighborhoods that were very, very poor. And she had huge success because she was teaching these practical life exercises. And she was opening their senses, which are pathways into our minds. So she was having them smelling and tasting and having them create a beautiful classroom and that was very important, the way that they took care of the classroom and, and, and made it a place, a desirable place to learn. And so this is part of what we've done at King. It is um, a place that when anybody walks in, they say, oh, <laughs> it's, it's something very special. And the garden is that way generally just because it's full of flowers as well 
as edibles. Edible flowers, I should say. Yes, edibles, not now, around here. You don't quite uh, say that. And <laughs> so I know that it takes this kind of empowerment of the students. Uh, at the Conscious Kitchen, they have ambassadors of edible education who come in the kitchen and help to cook. Now, getting back to that other issue of, of the enormous numbers that we have to deal with in the public schools, maybe there is a central place where lettuce might be washed or maybe a base of the soup is made and maybe we can have it like finishing kitchens at Chez Panisse. Upstairs, we cook, finish the food. We make it in the morning downstairs before the preparation for the downstairs restaurant begins. So it's, it's a different way of thinking about the organization of the kitchen. And it's so about vegetables and fruits. And a lot of them can just be cut up by the students at the time. So we're, we're thinking of an entirely different way of imagining a school lunch. As I'm sure we'll be reading in the book, I think the lady's been patient. Hi, this was wonderful, thank you so much. I did look up the Edible, edible Schoolyard Project and where I live part of the Please. year is Durham, North Carolina, Duke University, and we're not there. I mean, you, we don't have that there. How do you... Shame, the research triangle <laughs> enlightened <laughs> Durham. And, and great restaurants and great farmers markets. Absolutely. So please help tell us well, all. Well, there is, again, this fast food culture that has indoctrinated all of us. School system, too big. We can't do it. The children don't like it. That's, everybody hears that. And that they don't, I mean, they push away the French fries and the stuff. I was a principal for the day at Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School before the project, or right at the beginning of the project. And out of a thousand kids, probably, you know, maybe, maybe a third brought things from home. Maybe not that many. And uh, out of that third, whew, maybe 5% brought something that I thought was good. A lot about bagels and cream cheese and things in bags that, that, that were easy to pop in, you know, in the lunch. Um, and then there were a whole group of kids that didn't eat at all. And they would eat um, uh, after school. And I even got into the dumpster and examined all of what was there after... Field research. Yes. <laughs> and there's somebody who took a picture of me in the dumpster. <laughs> but I wanted to see what they ate before school. And it was coffee cups and candy bars. And uh, I just, it just that sort of fast food trash. I couldn't believe it. And then there were the kids that ate at the snack bar at the end of the school. And I watched them, and they just would scrape off right into the garbage anything that, that was kind of a vegetable, I would say. They kept you know, the meat kind of stuff and the fries. But everything else, I mean, huge waste goes on in the schools, huge. And of course, uh, the, the kind of discrimination that happens for the kids that get free and reduced, they have to be in this special line. That was one of the reasons uh, that New York City made that decision. It's they wanted equality. And when everybody is sitting at the same table, all of you at the same table from kindergarten, then that becomes the place of equality. And you're all familiar with lunch shaming 
and giving kids like um, ham or cheese sandwiches in a bag because their parents are behind on the bill. This yep. continues in Arizona and other, many other states, not just Arizona, that was a notorious case. So the idea of equality is one of the reasons that for years Alice has been tirelessly advocating for universal free school lunch, not free. just yes. uh, universal school lunch. Everybody eating the same thing, everyone having the same opportunities. Um, did I see hands up? That that hand was up. Sorry, the lady, lady on the aisle, whose hand was up before. Hello. Um, not only are you an incredible inspiration for restaurateurs, but also in the slow food m movement. Um, so you have built this incredible platform for you to be able to enact change. But I know it probably hasn't been easy. What are the biggest struggles that you've had and the hardest things to overcome? I think one of the biggest issues um, in the public schools, especially in the cafeterias, is the, the pay. The, people don't get anything for cooking food or, I mean, unwrapping the packages in the kitchen. And so there's a lot of competition there that's going on. And for to get in the good graces of that person, and it's the least harmonious place I, I have really been in. Because you're, you're not, um, uh, when I worked at Yale, because of the union rules, you, ha you had to do your, your job only according to the job description. So if you weren't busy, you couldn't help somebody else do the work. And we had one kind of a little crisis when we were doing a big dinner at Yale to win everybody over. And um, we were helping in the kitchen to make the food, of course, and we we're expecting apples to be delivered from Michael Pollan's farm at his house. He was bringing things from a neighbor's. And it was a snowstorm. And so he was going to be really late. And so we asked all the people in the kitchen, we'll all help to prepare everything else first. And then when the apples come, we'll make the galettes all together. That was the first time they had ever worked in that way, ever. And they all, we brought everybody out after the dinner. It was like uh, they had such pride in having accomplished that. It changed they, their whole idea of what they could do. I spent it, two days in the kitchen at Berkeley did. College. Berkeley College Berkeley is one Co of the residential colleges, appropriately enough, the one to take up Alice's idea. And they talked about never having uh, peel the carrot in a kitchen, no. uh, ne not understanding what garlic cloves looked like because they were always peeled and in brine yes. when they came, having no idea. But it was also the idea of trying to get around the union rules of what they could do in the brigade. And there was still this sort of jets versus sharks mentality between the, the different sections of the union that was very remarkable. I mean, there's uh, incredible factionalism within a ton of kitchens, but this was different. The, the school union? Well, that's what we're really trying to break down. And I think the greatest success has come when we all as cooks cook for the people in the kitchen. And we talk about it, talk about their childhood memories around food and how, how that can help us to, to, to really to work together to produce this meal. Uh, but we've had, you know, real resistance from the top person. But again, uh, you know, our schools have been industrialized like our farms. So there's the person at the top, and the people at the bottom, the teachers, the people are working, are disempowered. They really have no control over this, and people are making the decisions. So I always try to find a way to really respect the rules and make it impossible 
for anybody to, to accuse us. And so we have an open door kitchen. And you're not supposed to have that in the restaurant because, because of sanitary reasons. Well, we clean the kitchen so clean that it feels like the dining room. We label everything carefully, really carefully. We, we have people with clean aprons all the time. This is all part of what allowed the Edible Schoolyard Kitchen to exist at King. It's beautiful. It smells good. And you watch the kids, they know all the safety rules. They hold their knives to their side when they walk around. They all wear aprons. They wash their hands before they begin the class. And that, uh, even when we were designing the cafeteria for King, the usual way, it's, it's got to be white. It's got to be stainless. And I said, I don't want that kind of kitchen. We can make it a light color that's cleanable. It's about lighting. It's got to be good lighting, but it doesn't have to be fluorescent lighting. You can have pictures on the walls. The dining room we made so beautiful with wooden tables and little chairs. We, uh, we created a space with copper lamps and windows that open on the down outside. We made the dishwashing room the most beautiful part of the kitchen. <laughs> we did, uh, because they're always persecuted. The poor dishwashers are in the hottest place, no room. Uh, it's just awful. It's so very made... irresistible, that room. Um, in fact, <laughs> it's even... It he is. wanted to wash dishes there. It's even, I have. It's even very <laughs> beautiful. And did you not want to perhaps leave us with words you had just discovered? Yes, I picked up this book of Terry Tempest Williams because I knew I was coming to, to this beautiful place in Colorado. It's the open space of democracy. And I just opened to this page. And it said, in the open space of democracy, beauty is not optional, but essential to our survival as a species. Alice, thank you for bringing us beauty into our world, Thanks. into our kitchens, into our lives.